Excellent. Pretty cool to see so many uh, college students worshiping the Lord today. Yeah. You know, my, my whole Christian life, uh, people always tell me the same thing. Uh, you never know. You never know when you plant a seed. You never know. Sometimes you know. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that you will bless this time. I pray that we will hear from you, empty me, and uh, speak today. Uh, we need you. We need a word from you, Father. Just take us, take us deeper into a relationship with you. And uh, God, I praise you for all the things that you're going to do through the stirring that you put in our hearts. And it's in Jesus' name we pray all these things. Amen. Uh, we have been, we've been talking about how to get out of seasons of life. And I've uh, been doing this for quite some time. In doing this, we are walking through the book of Exodus. Uh, because in this book, the children of Israel have to walk out of a season of life, which for them was slavery. And that's super relatable uh, because many of you have had to walk out of a season of life that either felt like or was uh, some sort of slavery. And uh, this entire book and this entire scene is, is dripping with symbolism. And uh, so if you've been tracking with us the following weeks, awesome. If not, don't worry, I'm about to sum things up for you. Uh, even, e- even, even better, all the scripture that we're going to talk about is going to be on the screen. If you walked in here today and you don't have everything just all together, then that makes you everyone, <laughs> okay? No one walked in here with everything all together today. No one expected you to be a Bible scholar, no, none of that. If, if we were perfect, we wouldn't need Jesus. You may not even have a Bible, and we would love to give you one. Uh, we have those uh, today as you exit. We have uh, Bibles at the VIP section, uh, so please stop by and grab a Bible that's free, that is a gift from us, and we'd love for you to take this. Not a burden for us. Please do that. So be taking notes today. Write things down because we want you to go and read this uh, for yourself. Just do, do, do your homework, and maybe you want to fact check me. Maybe you just want to look deeper into the story. It doesn't matter to us. We love that you're going to meet with the Lord. So as you walk through this story, you find out that uh, God has this people that he has promised that was going to be a kingdom of priests for him. And you know them today as the Jews, or we'll call them Israelites, but they get caught in Egypt, and when they're in Egypt, they just flourish, absolutely flourish, and there's a ton of them, and Egypt becomes very jealous and says, hey, listen, if, if an enemy comes in and they switch sides, they're so numerous, we are doomed. So what they did was decide to make Egypt a slave, and so now you have God's people enslaved in a foreign land, and this dripping with symbolism because if you are a believer in here, and Jesus says that all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, so if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, accept His uh, salvation for your life, then you are like these people. You are in a foreign land. And so many times we get caught into something, right? And so for this, uh, that slavery is going to be symbolic of the problems of the world. Egypt is going to be symbolic of the world and God's people, right? This is, uh, this is you in a lot of ways. And what happens is uh, God tells His people to come out into the promised land. Now, we know they don't go straight to the promised land in the same way that you got saved and you're not in heaven yet. First comes the wilderness. In between slavery and the promised land is the wilderness, and that's where you are. That's why you are a foreigner in a foreign land. We are nomads here. And so the kingdom of God is already here because we have the Lord bringing us out of slavery, but it is not yet full because we're not yet in heaven. And so this whole whole wilderness thing is symbolic, but before they get into the wilderness, they have to first pass through the Red Sea, and this passing through the Red Sea is going to be symbolic of what? 
baptism. And so the people are uh, baptized, and so they pass through, they become something new, and they're in uh, the wilderness, right? Uh, Egypt is going to pursue them, and God is going to fight the battle for them, all right? And when they get to the other side, God has now split the Red Sea. The people part through it. When Egypt comes through, it closes in and destroys the Egyptian army. And now they are finally and officially out of slavery and they're into the wilderness. And so they're going to have a party and they're going to celebrate God, right? Well, let me ask, is that what you did? Yeah, they're going to do the same thing that you did. And so it's easy to read this story and be like, wow, you, you people, wow, because really it's us. Uh, because for many of you, if you will look back, you prayed to leave a season that you are no longer in. But if you think about it, I never think to God <laughs> because I'm not sure when I got out of that. I'm not sure. But whatever I was praying for 10 years ago, 5 years ago, 6 months ago is not here anymore and I never celebrated that. Instead, you did the same thing that these people are going to do. What do they do? As soon as, as, soon as Moses comes and says, hey, I represent God, I'm going to lead you out of slavery, the, the, there's a cloud of fire and a cloud of, of, of just protection from the sun that's going to, to, to walk in front of them for seven days and seven nights. Red Sea parts, they go through, and on the other side they say, I'm thirsty. Okay? Uh, and, and that's valid because I can't go long without water. And so Moses tells, or God tells Moses, strike a rock, and from this rock, water will come out. Now, uh, in the Old Testament, when we're talking about Jesus, there's one thing He's called more than anything else, and that is a rock. And so this also is going to be symbolic, because when the rock is stricken, living water, wait, oh wait, wait, this is just water comes out. Maybe you know the story about Jesus being crucified, Jesus being the rock, and when He is struck, Blood and water come out, and that pays for our sins. And so he tells a woman at the well at some point, he says, follow me and I will give you living water. So the rock is struck, water comes out, the people are nourished, okay? And then we go to Exodus chapter 16, verse 14 and 15. Are you ready for this? It's going to be on the screen. When the layer of dew evaporated, oh wait, I've got to give you something. After they were thirsty, guess what they were next? Hungry. Okay, this is where we jump in. When the layer of dew evaporated, there were fine flakes on the desert surface, as fine as frost on the ground. When the Israelites saw it, they asked one another, what is it? Because they didn't know what it was. Moses told them, it is the bread the Lord has given you to eat. So the people get through the Red Sea. They come into the wilderness. They're thirsty. God supplies them water. We know that's going to be symbolic of Christ. They're hungry. God's going to supply them with bread. And I'm going to tell you that's going to be symbolic of Christ. And you're like, dude, I think you're reaching for this. No, I'm going to read you some passages and I need you to understand that when you hold your Bible, there are 66 books in that Bible. There's an Old Testament and a New Testament, 39 books in the Old Testament. And they all tell a story about one day a Messiah is coming. And you're like, but do they really? Yes, that's what we're reading right now. Everything points to Jesus. There's 66 books, but there's one story. And it is the story of Jesus and his love for his people, okay? So they get to the other side, they're hungry, God tells Moses, I'll feed the people. They wake up the next morning and there's this stuff on the ground. And when the people wake up and see this on the ground, they ask, what is it? And they don't speak English, okay? Remember that as you read the Bible, you're reading an ancient Middle Eastern document. This is not American. And it's not dirty south even. In Hebrew, they say, what is it? And when you string those words together in Hebrew, it's ma-na, manna. 
And so you've heard maybe this before, that there was some bread-like substance. They said it's like coriander, to which I go, what is coriander? And it's on the ground every morning, the whole time they're in the wilderness. And they never called it bread, they called it manna, which means, what is it? But God never calls it, what is it? He calls it bread. It's important, all right? Hang with me, hang with me. Because this bread is going to be important for you. Because you get hungry. In fact, we look at these people and we're like, man, y'all are whiners. God is going to provide every need. But they are walking probably day and night through what we believe is probably at this point Saudi Arabia. (laughs) It's toasty. They're thirsty. They're the kind of thirsty that they think they're going to die. And they say, if I don't get some water, I'm not going to make it. Spiritually speaking, have you been there? Lord, you've got to give me something. It's not only am I not going to make it, I'm not going to make it past today. And when they get some water, they need some food. And they're telling the truth. They're not going to live long without water and food. Church, you are not going to live long without water and food. They will continue their whole lives to eat. What is it? Think about that for just a second. In their lifetime, they will never know what what is it is. <laughs> we believe that we are in a culture that has a God who gives common grace. And we say, oh, look at this. What is it? I love to snow ski, and my favorite thing to do when I snow ski is sit on the chairlift, and when I get to the top of the mountain, look behind me. You don't get that view very often. It is majestic, like really, really majestic. And I was sitting beside a guy, just some stranger, and uh, I looked behind me and I said, wow, look at that. And he said, isn't Mother Nature awesome? And I said, who is she? Who is she? Because I, he, just, he just created a new God. Who is she that she has done this? I need to meet this mother. Because that's some fine work. See, I believe that God made those mountains that I'm looking at. And it's funny because we are standing on an earth right now that is spinning outrageously fast. You ever notice, I mean, there's, there's going to be an eclipse coming soon. Do you notice that those don't last long? You know why? Because we're moving. We're moving, yet we're not flying off. It's incredible. And as we stand on this spinning ball, thinking thoughts, you, you, like your DNA is so complex. One of my, one of my uh, seminary professors He was in uh, Raleigh, North Carolina, and he said, listen, uh, we have a stadium here. And if he'd done the math, and he said, if I take this stadium and all the seats in this in this professional stadium, and it had no 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 roof on it, you know, it it was kind of a dome with no top to it. He said, if I took every seat and I stacked encyclopedias all the way out the top of the roof in every single seat. That stadium would not contain as much information as one of your strands of DNA. And, and here we are, 
thinking thoughts, with brains that we don't understand. I'm looking at you through eyes that I cannot possibly begin to tell you how they work. I've been to like five specialists for my eyes and every one of them go, I don't know. I mean, these are people who have forgotten more about the human body than I will ever know. And they're like, it's complicated. (laughs) We don't know. We stand here thinking thoughts like, how does that happen? Feeling love with our complex DNA on a spinning ball that is spinning in a direction opposite of many of the other things in our solar system. You ever think about that? As something was spinning, and let's say it exploded. Let's say that's how we're going with this, and it exploded. According to the law of angular momentum, everything is then exploded and goes out and does what? Spins in the same direction. But it's not all spinning in the same direction. Why? I think just to confuse you. Setting here on a, on a ball that is the right size to orbit around the sun, if you change anything, we're dead. If you change anything, well, the sun, this is happening to the sun, and this is happening to the earth. Yeah, and it's happening in synchronization so that we're not dead. The complexity of every single thing around us is, is, is too great for our understanding. Far too great. And we look around and we get on a ski lift and we look behind us and go, what is it? We look to the heavens and we see stars. How many stars? <laughs> Y'all know the star registry thing? I heard this years ago, so I'm sure it's changed now because there's more people on the earth. But I, I was always worried. When I was young, they started the star registry, and people would buy a star, and you name it after yourself. And uh, I was like, man, what if we run out of stars? This is so stupid. <laughs> and so somebody, was, somebody did the math on it, and they're like, look, here's how many stars we can see. Here's how many people are on the earth. So if we divided them all up evenly, the stars that we can see, everyone would get 11.7 trillion stars apiece. And I was like, oh, okay. I'm probably good then. At which point I'm like, that real estate should be a little cheaper. It is in mass quantity. So with my mouth that I can't tell you how it works, looking out with my eyes that I can't explain, at a universe that I can't possibly begin to understand, I question God. And I say, what is it? Never looking back at all the things that God has given me, all the questions that He has answered. And I'm just like, just like these that I read about. John chapter 6, verse 30 through 35. Speaking to Jesus, this is what is asked. What sign then are you going to do so that we may see and believe you? They asked, what are you going to perform? Our ancestors ate manna in the wilderness just as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, (laughs) this is awesome because you know what Jesus is, right? He's the bread from heaven. And the people are like, hey, 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 hey. So you're going to be the new one, right? Well, when Moses came, he gave us bread. What are you going to do? As they look at the bread of heaven, they ask, can you give us bread, right? Irony, verse 32. Jesus said to them, truly I tell you, Moses didn't give you bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. First of all, that was never Moses. It was my Father who did that, but now He gives you the true bread. Verse 33, for the bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said, sir, give us this bread always. And Jesus, and I don't know how He said it. I don't know how He said it. He may have said, 
I am the bread of life. Or he was like, I'm the bread. Are you, what? You've studied the scripture the entire time. This was on the nose symbolism. And I'm here. You've missed it. I don't know which one of those he did. But as I told you, you've never seen me, and yet you do not believe me. Listen, Jesus is the what is it. And many of you started, listen, we're in Texas. Most of the people who walk in here say, when I was old enough to talk, I told everyone I was a Christian, just because that's what everybody does. But at some point, I was thirsty, and I was hungry, and I had to choose what I was going to eat. And this is most of our story. No one else can feed you this. We are your cheerleaders. You are going to have to eat this bread. No one else can make this decision for you. Just because others around you are eating doesn't mean that you are. Pastor Dusty's a carnivore. He only eats meat. So commonly, he sits and watches uh, everyone else eat, and he lets me know that it's not the same to watch everyone else eat as for you to eat. In fact, it can just be more frustrating, right? Under Moses, bread came that would leave you hungry, Jesus said, I'm the bread for all time. In the same way that he told a woman, this water will quench your thirst for a little bit, but I will quench your thirst for all time. And it was never Moses that fed the bread. It was always God that gave the bread. It will never be Jared that gives you bread. It will never be Moses that gives you bread. It will never be a church that gives you bread. It will never be your spouse. It will never be your grandma that gives you bread. You have to eat the bread That is the Father. A human cannot give that to you. And I I said this not so long ago, but I want to repeat this. Um, This is not a confession for me. I have no sin that I've done that I have not confessed that I know of. But if something happens to me and I am caught doing something or, or I get kicked out of this place or my wife is like, we're out of here, I can't stay, whatever, Whatever. And you can't eat anymore after that? That's your fault, not my fault. Because if I'm the only one feeding you, you are malnourished and anemic. It is the Father who feeds you. And so I have no intentions of doing any of those things. But many people will tell a story, well, I don't have a relationship with God anymore because of this person. Bro, that's like me saying I'm not eating tomorrow because my favorite cook is sick. I'm still going to eat. Here's another way to look at it. John 6, 53. So Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood, you do not have life in yourselves. This gets weird, doesn't it? The one who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day because my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. The one who eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him, just as the living Father sent me, uh, and I live because of the Father. So the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. It is not like the manna your ancestors ate, and they died. The one who eats this bread will live forever. Do you feel dead spiritually? It's probably because you're not eating In the same way that you go through life and you feel like you have no energy and then you realize, oh, I was so busy at work, I didn't eat lunch. My blood sugar is messed up. I'm losing energy. I'm going down. This is what I've had so far today. Was this trash up here bothering anybody? You're like, I can't even listen to this slob. He's got trash up there. Uh, This is what I've had so far today. And uh, I will work out tomorrow. I work out 
four days a week, and some of you are like, hmm, couldn't tell. Thank you. <laughs> and I ate this this morning at 8.30. If I don't eat again, I will get nothing out of my workout. Right? I will get nothing. I will be a terrible husband, I assure you. <laughs> Hangry is a real thing. I will have no energy. Brain function will not be good. You think it would be ridiculous for me to try to go all of today having only this. You think it would be absurd for me to go all of today and all of tomorrow having only this. You think I'm just an idiot and I'm probably going to die soon if I try to go all week having only this. That is no different than your experience here today. You are eating here today, but this will not sustain you all week. God has a T-bone marinating for you right now. And He says that He's going to prepare a table for you in front of your enemies. All you got to do is show up to eat. Don't try to get it to go. <laughs> Don't try to scarf it down. Make time to stay with your father and eat. You've probably been trying to create life for yourself. See, when the children were walking through the wilderness, wherever it was, Sinai Peninsula, uh, Saudi Arabia, it doesn't really matter. It's all pretty toasty. Imagine them trying to, out of their own power, nourish themselves. It's ridiculous, right? It's the same for us. The Father wants to meet with you. He wants you to eat. They're dying because they have no food. They're dead spiritually. So try harder to feel nourished. How ridiculous. Go eat with the Father. Go pick up the bread. Now this is what I didn't tell you. And then i got to close with this. I want, uh, we have some who are being baptized. If you'll go ahead and wake, make your way up to the front. Uh, b I, I don't want to keep our uh, child care waiting any longer than they have to. This is the part that I didn't, wanna, uh, that, that I didn't tell you yet. And, and for, for time's sake, um, I'm just going to tell you this story. Please go back and read this. This is going to be in Exodus chapter 16. But here's what happened. When Moses commanded the people to go out in the morning and gather the what is it, and gather the manna, gather the bread. Here were their instructions. He said, go out, and this is how much I want you to gather. And they would gather, and they would bring it in, and you could eat it just like it was, or you could boil it, you could bake it. There were all sorts of things that you could do with this bread. But an interesting thing happened when they gathered it up and brought it back to the camp. No matter how much anyone gathered. Now look at me because I need you to hear this part. Because you write me off all the time on one principle. You say, Pastor, I don't know as much as you know. Listen, no matter how much they gathered, when they brought it back, everyone had the same amount. You say, how did that happen? Obviously, it was supernatural. God was making the less plenty and the more just sufficient. Everyone had a sufficient, sustaining, nourishing amount of the bread from God when they brought it back to the camp and ate it, regardless of how much they gathered. Why? He did that more than for them. Probably he's trying to keep some of them healthy. I get a practical application for that. I would have been overindulging myself. I know this because I do it now. But he did that for you because he wants you to understand that regardless of where you start, 
If you go home and open your Bible for the first time in your life today, or if you have a Ph.D. in theology and go home and open your Bible today, you know how much Jesus you will get? You will get a satisfactory, sustaining, nourishing amount. This is not just for one kind of people. A child could go and gather the what is it that we now know what it is can go and gather Jesus and have a satisfactory, sustaining, nourishing amount in the same way that any other person. Church, I want you to do a few things for me. I've got to cut this just a little bit short today. But I want you to do this. I want you, we, we say this all the time. Many of you know this. Here's, if you want to get closer to God, here are the four things that you do. You pray, you read your Bible, you go to church, and you be the church, okay? And we mean those things. We want you to pray. Many of you know that's just you talking to God. How long do I pray? What do I do? You pray until you've prayed, okay? Until God has heard your heart. Reading gets a little different. I don't read much. That's okay. That's okay. Because I believe that we have a supernatural God who will read to you, Okay? Uh, and so a lot of people are taking me up on this lately. I'm really excited about it. I want you to maybe write this down, write it on your hand. You have a connection card. Bust out the notes on your phone. I, I, please take me up on this if just once, if just once. I used to have a pastor who for, uh, for years and years and years would tell people, uh, if you will go home and you read your Bible for five minutes a day for seven days a week and it doesn't change your life, I'll quit my job. And uh, I, last I saw, he had done that for 30 years and he hadn't quit yet, Okay. God will meet with you if you'll give him a chance. Now, here's what I want you to do before you read, okay? Write these down. I'm going to give you four things. Uh, before you read, I want you to pray and ask God to speak to you, okay? I want you to pray and ask God to speak to you. Uh, it doesn't have to be a formal, long prayer. You just your heart has to be in it. The second thing I want you to do, and you don't have to do it exactly this way. This is my stuff. I want you to take a notebook, okay? I have a notebook. Lane, will you hand me this? Uh, my friend Tim made me this, and my whole life is in it, but I have this, and before I go to read, I set this beside me because soon as, as soon as I get still, as soon as I get calm, which rarely ever happens, Thoughts come, and I remember all the things that I haven't done yet, and if I'm not able to write them down, I know I'll forget it, and so I have to run and do it, right? So I, I go, oh, I got I to gotta, I gotta call Samantha, and so I just write down, call Samantha, and then I get back to my word. Maybe you can do that on your phone, whatever. I don't recommend phones, not because of anti-technology, because you're going to get calls, text messages. Satan's going to call and be like, hey, heard you were reading your Bible, right? Uh, take a notebook, how, whatever your version of that is. Get a pen and write it on your hand. I don't care. Be able to, whew, I'll get to that later, and meet with Jesus, okay? So pray, take a notebook. Pick a place. I don't mean like where in your home, where at work are you going to read. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying where at in the Bible do I go. Listen, if you are new to the Bible, now one day, I want, I want you all to have read the entire Bible one day. That's awesome. But for right now, I want you to go to the New Testament, okay? I want you to go to the New Testament. If you want to come argue with me about that later, please don't. It's just my opinion. But not, not in the Old Testament right now. I want you to go to the New. Where? It begins with four eyewitness or, or first-hand survey accounts of Jesus. And those books are Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. Which one should you read? I don't, I don't care. They're all from the Holy Spirit, okay? So any of those, I want you to begin to read. Now, how much do I read? Dude, until you got something. That may be, that may be ten verses and it may be ten chapters. Until you got something. Listen, if you go 10 chapters and you don't have anything yet, <laughs> we need to talk. <laughs> Give him a chance. Okay? Number four, and I already said it, read until you got something. Okay? So you're going to pray first. You're going to take some kind of notebook with you, something like that. You're going to pick a place in the Bible to read. And don't do the like, let it fall open and then just read a place. I, like, take it in context, verse by verse. I, 
this is just opinion, but many of you want to know, how do I get into this? And I'm, I'm giving you sort of a formula here. Uh, so the third is pick a place, and the fourth is read until you've read. Stay with the Lord until you've met with Him. How better would any relationship be if I just gave you my attention until you were done talking to me? That's how I think we need to handle our relationship with God too. So those are your four things. Okay, I have, I have more stuff, but if you are feeling spiritually dead, if you want to grow in Jesus, he has bread for you. Worship team, I want you guys to go ahead and come up. And uh, okay, we're gonna do some baptisms now, all right? Excellent. Um, okay, let's talk. Who's up first? Ricky? Okay, let's take this out. As much as it'd be fun to watch Ricky dance, let's not electrocute him today. No, the, it, it's off. It's off. Okay. Ricky, I'm, I'm going to ask you. You got a microphone for me, Chris? Awesome. Man, I'm going I'm to ask you just here in front of everything. And you got some people here to watch you today, right? Awesome. Thank you all so much. Awesome. Uh, praise God. Thank you for being here. Uh, Ricky, hold that for just a second. Um, Guys, this is Ricky, and uh, he has given his life to Jesus. Uh, but Ricky, I want to ask you in front of God and everyone, in front of your, your family and your church family, have you accepted Jesus as your Lord? I mean, like boss, like Ricky's no longer in charge of Ricky, God's in charge of Ricky. Have you that kind of Lord and Savior? Have you accepted Christ as Lord and Savior? Yes, sir. All right, use the microphone, man. I want to yes, hear sir. it. All right, all right. You guys hear that? And uh, upon his profession of faith, go ahead and get in there. Oh, yeah. It's very warm. Okay. All right. I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with him in death. Raised to walk in newness of life in Jesus Christ. Yeah, man. Proud of you. Proud of you. Awesome. Okay. All right. I think we have. Who's up next? Zeke? All right, Chris. Come on. Let's hand this to Chris. He can hand it to you. It's a. It's such an honor to get to to be here with Zeke today. I've I've seen him grow and mature so much in his faith this uh this past couple of years and uh we call our our youth group 180 youth because you got to get to a point in your life where you say we say i'm tired of going the direction that i'm going i'm tired of doing things my own way and you reverse course and you start to follow god and i've seen that in zeke these past couple of years and it's just such an honor to get to do this today so you can go ahead and go ahead and step in Zeke, I'm, I'm going to ask you in front of all your family and friends, have you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior over your life and as for the sacrifice for your sins? Yes, sir. All right. And it's such an honor to get to baptize you today, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried him in death. Raised to walk in the newness of life. Awesome. All right. All right. Giovanni, come on. Yep. Yep. Look at that. Athlete. Athlete. All right. I'm going to ask you to hold that. Now, I told you guys, sometimes you know. Sometimes you know. Uh, Giovanni heard that. Uh, tell, tell him why you ended up over at the student center. Um, I ended up at the student center because I was hungry and I heard they had good food over there. Yep. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh-huh. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah, but uh, I got there and I was really touched by what I heard. And I had no intention in hearing, but it touched me. Yeah. Amen. All right. All right. Well, you guys hear that, so I'm going to ask you in front of your church family. And... Uh, He's about to, Manny's about to go home for the summer, not from around here, but I'm going to ask you in front of your, in God, your family, everybody, uh, have you accepted Jesus Christ as both your Lord and your Savior? Yes, I have. All right. Excellent.
Oh, it's turned off. That probably has something to do with it. Uh, listen, when service is over, I know that somebody's going to come and close the service today, but um, there's a Shooter's Cafe just right down the road, this direction. Uh, the building right behind it is our student center. Uh, because we're not in our building, uh, that's where we'll be having pizza with Pastor today. So literally just a stone's throw away. You could walk there uh, or you can drive over there. Uh, but if you want to be a part of what's going on at the church or just find out what we're doing and why we're doing it, um, I'll be over there. Come have lunch with me, and I'll give you the whole scoop. We'll try to get you in and out in about an hour and feed you as well. So I hope that you will join me for that. But worship team. <laughs>